I bet Jack Lester was a fun guy to referee, wasn't he? Uh, <laughs> he was um, competitive. So he's at Sheffield United now. I refereed them a couple of weeks ago, and I had a chat with him briefly because they 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 were um, complaining about a potential penalty or something, and I I did point out to him that I booked him in that game for diving because um, I remember he, he was my second yellow card. Rob Page was, was also in the book that day. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I did point that out to him, and he did have a bit of a laugh. Hi everyone, uh, Dave here. Thanks for coming along to another episode of the podcast. This is Legends of the Spire where I speak to the former players and managers of Chesterfield Football Club about their careers. Now today it's a little bit different. I actually spoke to a referee uh, instead of a footballer uh, as I spoke to Graham Scott. Now my apologies if the podcast has become a little bit more sporadic in recent weeks. Mixture of factors really. Firstly, availability of uh, former players. Uh, happy to come on and have a chat. Um, sorting out a time with them. Obviously, the world is speeding up again at full pelt and also I've been a bit busy at work, but hopefully got one again uh, coming up in uh, week two's time. Uh, so as soon as I've recorded that and edited it, I'll get it straight out there. This week, though, something a little bit different uh, for you to listen to as I spoke to Graham Scott, who is a Premier League referee, but actually was the man in charge in the middle uh, in our last ever game at Saltergate against Bournemouth all those years ago. We obviously won that 2-1 uh, with a last-minute Derek Niven winner, so great memories from that day. And he shared his memories uh, of that match, which he puts in his top 10 uh, that he's ever taken charge of, which with 450-odd games under his belt, that's quite something. He is now uh, on the PGMOL list for Premier League referees, uh, actually spoke to me the day after taking charge of uh, Nottingham Forest Man City. Uh, so really good to have a chat with him too uh, about his journey to becoming a Premier League referee, uh, his, his support for Swindon Town uh, and also the differences between taking charge of a Sunday League match and a Premier League game. So I hope you enjoy listening to it. As always, I am at Spy Legends on Twitter and Instagram and Legends of the Spy on Facebook. So it'd be great to hear from you. Please do like, share, repost, retweet, whatever it is that you can do to share the word. But here we are, taking you back down memory lane this week uh, with a chat about the last ever game at Saltergate from the man who took charge that day. It's Graham Scott. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming on and having a chat. Obviously, having a chat because you did, you refereed the last ever game <laughs> at uh, at Saltergate, which we'll come on to. But I just wondered how you kind of started as a referee because it was you was kind of ninety seven, was it? Yeah. You joined like the list, and you were like what late twenties then? Yeah, uh, so I was twenty nine when I did the course. Um, yeah, when I played football, um, I was a goalkeeper. I played in kind of lower reaches of non league football. Um, bottom of the pyramid stuff, um, but then when I got I got an injury in about ninety five, uh, ninety no ninety six early ninety six got injured and um, in my back and I did I got back and I was could have played again but um, decided I didn't want to risk a serious back problem late later in life and lost my appetite a little bit for playing, mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to be involved in football and um, didn't really want to coach or think you know there weren't any other options that particularly appealed and I'd always had an interest in refereeing from quite young I think I'm not quite sure why I couldn't put my finger on why that was but um decided I would inquire about a course I, at that time it was I couldn't work out why but they didn't run any courses in the summer so I had to wait until the start of the season uh the 97 98 season so I still did the course and, and in those days it's changed very much changed now but when you became a referee, it was it was a bit like learning to drive by reading the highway code and then expecting to be good at it. Um, so we literally learned the laws of the game in a classroom and then bought some kit and away we went. <laughs> so it was a bit daunting, but um, being that kind of age and having played a better level of football than I was initially refereeing probably gave me a bit of a head start. So um, settled in quite quickly and enjoyed it. And then with no ambition at all, um, just, just refereed, you know. And then a couple of years later, I'm, I was invited to be to go onto the into the kind of proper non-league structure 
from a refereeing point of view. So yeah, I didn't I didn't even know there was a ladder to climb, but um, just got on the first rung, and then from there it just kind of things kind of took care of themselves every few years, and ended up in the football league in two thousand and eight as a referee on the line in two thousand and five. Hmm. It's funny because I've spoken to quite a few football managers uh, on this and they all said that their kind of philosophy of what kind of football manager they would be, then when they started being a football manager, they had to kind of throw it out the window because they were actually <laughs> completely different. I imagine being a re- is being a referee similar? Do you have kind of a, a the referee that you think you're going to be and then you start it and it kind of changes? Um, I didn't really start off with any sort of philosophy, if you like, to use that analogy. Um I guess what drives me as a person is a sense of fair play, really, and wanting to see a fair outcome. So justice is very is kind of my one of my core values, if you like, as a person. So on a football pitch, I want just want to see the right decisions and a fair outcome. And it it's trying to find the balance between often in football, people and ref, referees get criticised, but the one end we're criticised for being inconsistent. And, uh, but if we're in, incons- if we are very consistent, then we're criticised for being robots. Mm-hmm. And actually, you can't, you know, w- whichever we do, people will find a reason to criticise. Um, the the best referees, I hope, and I'd like to think I've managed to do this most of the time, is I find a balance between the two. So you find a, a level of consistency that people can accept. You can know pretty much what's coming next, mm-hmm. but also some common sense mm-hmm. that goes well on this particular occasion. I'm going to deal with this instance slightly differently to how I might have done on it in another game in another context um so that would be my general p- attempt to let's say find the right balance and I think when people people generally can respect referees and understand the way they go about the business when it's not their team playing but as soon as it's your own team you judgment comes it rather, go impaired. On. <laughs> <laughs> it's rather impaired and I'm no different. I mean, I, I, I support Swindon in town and if I go and watch them, I want them to win, you know, and I, I sometimes have to fight myself a little bit not to criticise one of my colleagues, you know. <laughs> just, that's football, you know, that's the way it is. And what are the badges like to do or the, or the coaching levels to do? Are they quite... Is it, <laughs> the ref? Yeah. Um, well, you, you start up now, they start off with... Um, we did a kind of 10-week once a week evening kind of two hours in a local club football club now they do a day and a half some of which is practical um and then they go into a six game cycle of doing uh, matches that are supervised so they have someone with them mentoring them and keeping an eye up you know covering their back in case anything happens where they need a bit of extra support from then on, it's a case of moving, as you move through the, move up the pyramid, um, at each stage you go through an assessment process. So that would be based primarily on your performances on field, based on what ex-referee, um, ex-referees come along and watch you and will give you a mark. And the clubs also mark at that level. So uh, those things kind of take all taken into account. And then there's a kind of an assessment process to look at you as a person as well, to look at the kind of commitment you can make, um, the kind of person that you are, um, whether you're the kind of present the right kind of what the um, football association or the leagues at that level want, want to see from referees. Mm. Um, and then you, as you move through, that becomes of course much harder and harder at each level. But it's primarily, based, our promotions are primarily based on what we actually do on field and how that's assessed by um our peers and by um the clubs yes and do, does it get harder as you go up <laughs> yes <laughs> and no. yes and no is the honest answer mm. to that so <clears throat> there are quite a few things about being a referee that um can get easier the pattern of play the quality of the, the quality of the football the um the standard of the pitches all help to make it much more predictable you can see where the ball's going to go next also, higher up, there tend to be fewer challenges. So if you watch challenges for the balls, if you watch um, not Premier League games now, teams don't tackle. They keep their shape and they try and intercept mm. or rely on the other team giving the ball away or making a mistake. Um, whereas in the National League or in the lower divisions of the Football League, there's much more challenge. There's much, there are many, many more tackles. The ball's up for grabs. Teams are less secure in possession, 
which, which makes it harder for the referee because they're making more decisions. Um, and they're having to try and pitch their involvement. Let's go back to my earlier point around consistency versus common sense. If you give everything, well, you kill the game. You have 50 free kicks and people get really fed up. But equally, if you if you give some and not others, then people say, well, what's the difference between the one five minutes ago? So it's really tough to pitch that right. The best do it well. Um, and generally, of course, when I mean, the standard of the refereeing is comparable to the standard of the football, so they're not going to be the very best refs. Well, the players aren't the very best players either. So we, they're usually align reasonably closely. So Mark Allett stands over the free kick. It's lifted in towards Brecken. And then Demontagnac. Brecken in there again. Connell. Austin. Rundle. Allett headed away that time by Bartley. Back in again, away by Pierce. Niven. Bowery. Leicester. Leicester shot! Jack Leicester scores with his Barrax. Chester Villa Lyle. With 10 minutes to go. The 8th of May 2010. Yeah, I'm asking you about this. You probably don't remember anything about that day at all. I don't know. I do. But, I do real quick. Well, uh, I've done nearly 450 games as a ref um, across the football leagues, Premier League, cup competitions, and so on. And the game, this game, would, would comfortably be in my top ten in terms of the games I remember and the games I've enjoyed and I've taken something from uh, because be, simply because of that sense of occasion. Really, uh, it really was. I mean. Um, when the appointment came through, I was really pleased to have it because I knew what was what it was. I knew what was going to happen. It was going to be the last game at uh, what I call the recreation ground. I noticed you yeah. called it Salter Gate. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was going to be the last game there. Um, there was something on it. So um, my recollection is that Chesterfield had a slim chance and it was unlikely, but they could squeeze into the playoffs if yeah. they won and other results went their way. And they were playing Bournemouth, who were champions. So there was a very much a party atmosphere, sense of anticipation. They they brought, I think they're pretty sure they sold out their allocation and they were in a you know, relatively jolly mood. Um, so there was, you know, I do remember it well. And also, I mean, from, from when we arrived at the ground, the people behind the scenes at Chesterfield then, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if they're still there, but the people behind the scenes was, you know, were the friendliest we could ever meet on the circuit. They were absolutely fantastic. We always really looked after us really well. And I'd heard about that. So um, I wasn't surprised that's what I found when I got there. Not, it was my only visit to, to, to Saltergate. Um, so from the moment we arrived through through to the end of the game, it was there was a real sense of um, a celebration as well as anticipation around the game itself. So the game mattered. And I think that really helped. I think if it had just been a mid-table kickabout, um, it would have been maybe felt a bit less so. Um, it did that. The importance of the of the result, um, although it was unlikely Chesterfield would, would get into the top six, um, they had a chance. So um, see, so um, made it all better. Yeah, it was like I remember it. Everyone had lots of flags and people had their faces painted and stuff like that. It was yeah. almost like a uh, <laughs> like a, a cup game or something like that, as opposed to a as as a league match. And yeah. I suppose. I suppose, yeah, it's the way that it ended as well with getting like a last minute winner, good old Derek Niven, yeah. uh, scoring in the last minute. I suppose with games like that, even without the last minute winner, you would have had to, you would have expected probably a pitch invasion at the end. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And things like that. So there's things yeah. to like, there was always going to be one of those. That being the last there was always, season. yeah, there was always going to be a, a pitch invasion. So, um, I mean, the other thing, because the score really mattered um, and the integrity of the competition is obviously so so important um there wasn't any option of saying right let's play 90 minutes and get off because it doesn't matter um the result doesn't matter if it was a cup game and the game and the game was over you'd probably do that on just on safety grounds and get off but um the last minute winner was just before the time was up um so we had from, from memory anyway 
Um, and I, I mean, one of the things people ask us about being a ref, what's it like? One of, one of the biggest benefits is you've got the best seat in the house. And I was pretty much right behind that shot. And as soon as he hit it, even though he didn't hit it as sweetly as he might, I was pretty much sure it was going to go in. And um, then I saw people coming from everywhere. So, <laughs> um, so it was a, you know, it was a very exciting moment and um, you know, really, you know, a good goal. And, um, you know, it would kind of cap the day, I guess. And and like you say, obviously you've, your role is to be impartial and the integrity of the game and stuff like that. But at the same time, you're a football fan yeah. yourself. So I suppose being part of those occasions, there's probably a bit of you going, oh, good on him, you know, in terms of getting that goal and, and <laughs> like being, seeing the, Seeing the the story of of that match kind of yeah. happening and being part of it yeah. without losing In your part. impartiality, if you know. What yeah, I mean. oh, absolutely. No, I, no, I mean, yeah. You you can you can see the human um, response for everyone. I mean, there's thousands of people there, all so happy. I mean, how can you not be swept along yeah. by a bit like that? Um, from a referee point of view, the the, chat, the concern I had was around the people on the pitch, and and we still had a few minutes to play. And there was no option to think, well, let's just go. Uh, we had to finish the game um, properly. And I wasn't sure. I was. My concern was whether, because the club was geared up for an invasion at the end of the match. Of course they were, but they weren't geared up for an invasion in the 90th minute because they can't be. You know, you can't know they're going to be a goal. Um, I mean, event, people just dispersed, didn't they? And it, it, they, we just got the game back on, albeit with people now standing virtually on the pitch. Um, but um, what the last few minutes played. I made sure I got the ball and stood as near to the tunnel as I could before I blew, so I could get off <laughs> um, to get off safely. But um, yeah, we, I mean, it, yeah, there was a. It was a very very joyous moment, quite plainly. And and normally when people run onto the pitch, we're very concerned because, as we've seen in in, in other games, you know, people run on pitches and all of a sudden there's trouble, there's a difficult, there's a problem. Um, and we are also vulnerable, of course, in those, in those circumstances because people don't always like us. But um, I didn't feel for a moment feel um, threatened or, you know, there were people right next to me, you know, I was looking, looking around, going, oh, hello. Um, but, um, you know, they were, they were clearly just so happy. Um, so it was fine. Yeah, it was just it was just great fun. And, and anyway. like old grounds like that, do you do you miss some of the old grounds oh, like that? Oh yes, 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 very much so. I mean, I loved the atmosphere there. Just that sense. I mean, I've seen the damn United. I know it's used in that. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the atmosphere there and the, and the older stadia. Um, personally, I'd always rather be in that sort of environment than at the new grounds. Some of the new grounds are fantastic. The facilities. That the pro actor great um and i can see why clubs sometimes just have to have to move it's not an option to upgrade what they've got and there are things about so from a uh, facilities point of view I mean, salter gate was famous for some of its lack of facilities shall we say but um i think you know that uh but um but in terms of the atmosphere and the feel of being in a in a football stadium football ground probably he's calling it a football ground rather than a stadium is um, I much prefer, and uh, when I was brought up watching Swindon, so um, the counter ground hasn't really changed much since the it's one side has changed since the seventies, so it still has a little bit of a feel to it. Mm. Um, and I love the grounds that have retained that um, that slightly old fashioned feel. Um, well, as I say, understanding the difference between the baseball ground and and Pride Park would be a classic, really. The baseball ground only ever, only ever went to once to watch a game, um, but the atmosphere was absolutely fantastic. Pride Park is a terrific stadium. So of the new grounds, it's it's um, one of my favourites to be be at. I think it, you know, the feel of it and the atmosphere and so on. Um, but I I think Derby fans would hanker for the baseball ground a lot of the time, uh, just the feel of it and the, the unique nature of it. You know, you knew immediately where you were. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think we, we'd all agree the same. Like Tuesday nights at Saltergate was something, something special. A night under the yeah. lights with the yeah. mist swirling round, but like you say, a, a, a set of toilets with a roof on. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> it's quite nice to, to have. Start. 
<laughs> and I heard the story of, of at the end of that game at Saltergate that John Croot, who is now uh, very high up uh, in the club at Chesterfield, uh, and obviously was then asked you for your whistle. Yes. Um, and you gave him the whistle and your shirt, didn't you, I think? I think I did, yes. I'd forgotten about that. But yes, but yeah, I did, yeah. I think it was it one of those kind of pinky salmon pink ones from memory. I think it is, yeah. I've seen a I'll picture of it online of you, your son's shirt, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I did, yeah, yeah. I, th- I think he's spoken in an, in an interview that at some point they're, they're going to look at getting it framed and put up in the club somewhere, right. the uh, the whistle and the shirt, which yeah, is yeah. quite a nice uh, nice bit of history to have have sent to a football club, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. No, I. Um, it's funny. I've got. I think I probably that must have then had to go and buy buy a new one, um, and I'm still using it now. So I'm. <laughs> and like you said, uh, uh, you have been at the the Pro Act. B two net pro act technique, whatever it probably was called when you were uh, when you pro, were with us. I think, pretty sure. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that was Chef United, wasn't it? So, um, so it must be interesting. You must have done a lot of the a lot of the ninety two. There's a lot of fans go around and tick off the ninety two. Yeah, I suppose I've you've done a few. Done a league. I've refereed a league match at ninety three grounds, but I haven't done the ninety two. That doesn't sound too dumb. Mm-hmm. So, um, several clubs I've done it to. The Chesterfield would be one of them. Refereed them at two different grounds. Um, I referee Coventry at three different grounds. So you do you do kind of tot up a few of those. Mm. And also the, the churn. So Chesterfield aren't, of course, a league club at the moment, unfortunately. Um, but the clubs that have come into the league recently, I've not been to. So Sutton United, I've played at Sutton, but I didn't um, have refereed there. Harrogate, Salford, um, and then clubs in the what for me is the far northwest. I live in Oxfordshire, so Carlisle, Fleetwood. Morecambe and so on have not been Barrow have not been to so there's about 10 I've not um, refereed at um, but there's 93 that I have been to hmm. yeah interesting um, so being a referee then we've kind of come to the end but being a referee do you uh, the enjoyment of the game do, do you do you watch games differently now as to when you were uh, playing or before you were <laughs> refereeing at high high up I suppose there's part of it that you'll always be looking at it from a certain angle even as a fan okay. yeah yeah so if I watch any any game not involving Swindon or not involving England uh, in a tournament or whatever or just an international then I'm not a fan I'm watching the ref and it's a it's largely it feels like work you know <laughs> it feels like I'm watching for a technical point of view um and it, it is a shame in a way there's that little, little bit of sense of enjoyment of us watching the match for its own sake but you're still following the game so a game that you know, the team does come back from I went to a game in the week where I coached the referees and um, I went to a game in the week in London which went from nil three to four three in the last 10 minutes so clearly I was kind of swept along by the excitement of that uh, but yeah you do watch I certainly do watch the games more from a refereeing perspective than a just a fan or just watching the game for its own sake uh, because I mean in the Premier League they're my they're my friends and my colleagues mm. so you know I'm willing them on and hoping they're going to do well um, so I'm there for them that's you know, what's, that's what I'm looking out for great well thanks for uh, thanks for coming on and having a, a, a short chat okay. with me it's great that you're part of <laughs> uh, even though you probably don't think about it very much but being a part of uh Chesterfield's history by yeah. uh, playing that role is is quite a nice thing to have, isn't it? I think we probably don't uh, don't often appreciate as well the fact that you're all there to uh, make the game happen so that we can actually watch it. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we hope to facilitate the best possible game for people to watch. You know, that's it's not it's not our game. Um, it's it's the players' game and the fans' game, and um, that's how certainly how referees should view it, and I think the vast majority do. Um, just, I'm going to have one other connection to Chesterfield, and that my first football league match as a referee was Barnet against Chesterfield. So um, that was obviously, obviously a game that meant a huge amount to me at the time. That was in 2008, which Chesterfield won. Um, you had Jack Lester and Rob Page playing. So yeah. I, don't, I don't know how you got on that season, but you were certainly won that day. Um, so yeah, I, I have a I have a certain affection for the club, and I wish you well. You know, I know you're pushing for promotion, aren't you? So um, wish you well in that pursuit.
Demon Sanyak, we've had five minutes of stoppage time played now as we enter the final minute. Alec will take the throw. Brecken, Niven shot.